the American left has, of course, a number of inputs, and we all know, I think, those of us who are interested in about the role of Europeans, the late 19th century Central European immigrants, especially German and Russian Jews, who brought a lot of class consciousness um, to the shores of America and explains why places like New York City were a real hotbed of uh, left-wing agitation. But what most Americans would be perhaps surprised to learn is that in 1912, Debs' best state, proportionately, was Oklahoma. And in Texas, he won in 1912 8% of the vote, which is considerably better than he would win today, I suppose. Although the last Democratic primary maybe causes people like me to have to revisit that. What I discovered in my research, which is most fascinating to me, is that if you if you exclude the urban areas, and yes, Texas actually did have cities and towns in 1912. And if you hold, if you take them out of calculation and look only at the rural precincts, that percentage doubles. The countryside voted for Debs at 16% here in 1912. And the, the, one of the most telling things about that to me is that the 1912 electorate is post, is, uh, is uh, the post poll tax electorate. So let me just start with a discussion of that before we get into the, the details of the party. Probably due mostly to the populist revolt and their discovery that the bottom half of the electorate, the white poor majority, were unreliable. There was, they weren't supposed to be. They've been trained since the 1600s not to think about class. White Southerners were taught Class doesn't exist, it doesn't matter, it's taboo. Only one thing matters, color, and I'm a member of the master race. So I can imagine my ancestors in their filthy log shack with their hound dogs sleeping on the front porch and pigs wallowing in the front yard and up rolls a big shiny Lexus carriage with white horses and Old Massa gets out and comes over to him and says, you know, Brother Wilkerson, that's me and you, baby. That's me on top, but nevertheless, we're white brothers. You may not be a member of the master class, and we promise never to talk about class again, but you're a member of the master race. And that had worked. Um, the poor folks hit the bait uh, for, for a long time. And then along came the Farmers Alliance, the Greenbackers, the Populist Party, and the ruling class discovered that those people were not as reliable as they had been, for whatever reason. It could have been the, the catastrophe of discovering the Civil War was a rich man's war and poor man's fight, you know, where the, the, those, those people in the shack died on the battlefield while their slave-owning white brothers were exempt. So for whatever reason, and of course the, the deflation, the ruinous, Currency deflation of the 1890s. At any rate, this produced this populist revolt, and Texas, the rulers of Texas, discovered that these poor folks would vote them out of office if given a chance. They <clears throat> produced these charismatic leaders. Here is the 1892 and 1894 Texas gubernatorial candidate of the People's Party, and he was an avowed, openly avowed socialist. There was didn't make any bones about it. District judge from Stephenville. You've been Stephenville. <laughs> Next time you're caught behind a horse trailer at Stephenville, just remember that the guy in the baseball cap in that pickup is probably the great great grandson of a socialist. Just just a thought. Thomas L. Nugent was a <clears throat> district judge in Stephenville and ran twice as the gubernatorial candidate of the People's Party and got um, astonishingly high numbers in 92 and 94. The Texas governor in those days served two-year terms. His replacement, he died, and in 1896, his replacement, many Texas historians, mainstream, non-hippie freak revisionist Texas political historians believe that the People's Party probably won the 1896 election. But the Democrats, the conservative party, 
just simply were not going to have it. As one of their senators from South Carolina said during that period, we stuffed ballot boxes, we shot people, we were not ashamed. Because what was at stake for them, how they could sell this to their own people, was that white supremacy was at stake. The populists, while made up of the poor white majority, did have black allies, and black people voted for them, that was enough. And the same kind of eliminationist rhetoric, a rejection of the democratic process that we've been hearing in our own time, was alive and well back then. And it wasn't just talk down in Grimes County. You know where Grimes County is? Anderson, Nevisota. Okay. In 1899, the Democrats there formed something called the White Man's Union. Get this, the county clerk and the county sheriff were both populists. The county clerk was African American, the county sheriff was white. They shot them both, just took over. No one was ever charged uh, or indicted for those crimes. So uh, to be a radical in Texas in this period of time was a dangerous thing. After the People's Party collapsed, <clears throat> most of the former populist voters were drawn into the Bryan wing, the William Jennings Bryan, Free Silver, You Shall Not Crucify, Labor Upon the Cross of Gold, that guy, were drawn into the Bryan wing of the Democratic Party, which is, uh, you know, the equivalent of today's neoliberals, I suppose. Leaving the angriest and most disfranchised and most ideologically committed left wing of the People's Party homeless. And that party died, slowly. They were still running candidates into the 1900s, but getting only a handful of votes. Meantime, <clears throat> there was elsewhere, out of New York City and Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a new socialist movement was being born. Now, splinters of the Daniel DeLeon-led Socialist Labor Party. Uh, he's speaking of Roger Williams. He was, Daniel DeLeon was sort of the Roger Williams of the left. Uh, he was constantly purging people who weren't quite right on, on uh, their dogma. And so some of his former supporters got together with Victor Berger and Eugene Debs and formed the Democratic Socialist Party and then eventually Socialist Party of America, which is the party they'll be tracing today. But even before the, the, those nationally known names that I just listed got together, Texans were already hard at work. One of them, an old Farmers Alliance, Greenbacker, later populist, uh, railroad worker and farmer from Bonham, Texas. Bonham, Sam Rayburn's hometown, another hotbed of uh, left-wing radicalism, founded the Texas Socialist Party. He, Freeman, uh, excuse me, W. Um, Whit Bill Farmer actually called for a sort of People's Republic of Texas that didn't get too far beyond Fannin. County, but he was in correspondence with national leaders and was one of the, one could say, the, the founders. Now, <clears throat> there's a number of founders. The party grew up in the North Texas area, in Dallas, and the, the farm communities to the northeast of it. And then there was, especially Van Zandt County, you know where Van Zandt County is? Okay. Which is a, a very interesting county, and it's my half-baked theory that one of the reasons it may have flourished there, one was local interest. There were some local people who had a lot of uh, respect in the community that were radical populists who joined the socialist movement. But part of it was that the county seat, the largest center of uh, population, the Democrats could not use fear of, quote, black nomination, which was what they were peddling because Grand Saline was, ironically, a sundown town. It had zero black population. And it's more difficult to, to invoke race treason in that kind of a setting against dissidents. And uh, there's so many layers of irony there that you know, we won't mess with that going forward. In 2010, the Texas Historical Commission <coughs> authorized this historical marker just outside of Grand Saline to commemorate the home place of one Jacob Rhodes, who, who is credited on this marker with being the founder of the Texas Socialist Party. So if you're 
you know, out driving. This, I, I think this is probably the only one. So if you want to take your kids on a road trip to see a bona fide Texas highway historical marker about socialism, <laughs> then you're just, what, two counties away to the east and slightly south to Grand Saline. Jacob Rhodes was not the founder, but we can call him one of those. He and his brother, Lee Rhodes, and Jacob, or Jake Rhodes, were old populists and um, farmers. Jacob had been a school teacher, and I think Lee Rhodes had actually served a term as a state rep, as a populist, but they were early adopters as well of the Texas Socialist Party. So that's another center. Eventually, uh, sort of the Johnny come lately to the story. A father, and, a father and son duo down in Lovaca County, Hallettsville, which is considerably south of Grimes from here, founded a newspaper and hired a wickedly talented Irish immigrant named Tom Hickey to run that newspaper, and that becomes another center of uh, Texas Social. 